Well, thank you, everyone. It's really an honor to be here and then to hear so many brilliant talks. The food was delicious and healthy. <laughs> so I think that's important given today's topic. So before I jump into the data, I want everyone in this room to take a minute and think about what we have come so far. 20 years ago, the human genome was decoded. And that, at that time, the whole research community, community was very optimistic. People think that we can develop finally the targeted um, therapies that remove those bad genes and then completely eradicate a lot of disease, including cancer. But 20 years have passed and we are very far from that promise. And this is not an issue just with cancer, it's across the whole biomedical research. But it's especially disappointing for cancer because cancer was considered a disease caused by gene mutations. So this is a, this is a problem that a lot of researchers and scientists have been thinking. Um, and recently in this book, um, the reference is down to there, I called Rethinking Cancer is I think the first book that confront this question directly. And they pointed out it's something to do with how we think about disease. The current paradigm is that the cancer is caused by a number, maybe a few specific genes that are dysregulated or mutated. But after 20 years of research, at least, we now know that DNA level information, they are important, but they are not sufficient to understand the whole picture. A new paradigm is needed. And this paradigm calls for systematic review of cancer that embraces all these different elements, different associations, different correlations that sometimes are even weird to put them together. And we really need to understand the cellular ecosystem rather than just a single component of the cells. And this is because by nature, the biological system is complex and dynamic. Still practicing this. So on the on the far left, you can see um, typical glucose metabolism pathway, and this is what we learned from our textbook. The metabolism pathways they are organized in a stepwise fashion. Um, there are certain enzymes that facilitate those steps. But if you look closely, these steps are connected by some of the common metabolites like ATP and ADP, they participate in a lot of these reactions and they um, connect these pathways together into a network. And if we think about how these enzyme activities are regulated on the genome level, and this is shown on the right, then things get a lot more complicated very fast because we have a very large number of genes that control different expression levels, different protein activities, and all of these can contribute to the ecosystem I just mentioned about. So how can we study this very complex system? Can we measure the individual of those metabolites? And the answer is yes. Um, recently, the whole analytical world has a, a pretty big breakthrough. And this is the break, the, I think is a revolution of the technology <coughs> in mass spectrometry. So instead of measuring like one amino acid at a time in the past, now we can measure tens of thousands of uh, metabolite signals. And this is shown in this workflow here. We can, you know, one cell specimen, we can measure a lot of signals and then we can put them into computational tools and to find out what signals are actually associated with our disease. And in the end, we can also ask the questions, what functions are these metabolites representing? And what networks do they uh, contribute to? And this workflow has, was initially developed by Dean Jones at Emory uh, School of Medicine and has been repeatedly published in different uh, publications. Uh, to prove the methodology and then to apply them to different studies. And one of the applications uh, today I will show you is about how these metabolic metabolites um, review the functions of the cells. And to test the coverage of metabolites, we can map these, the things we can detect to the whole uh, metabolome pathways. And the CAT 
map here is the most comprehensive knowledge about human metabolism. And all these black dots here are the things we can measure from this map. And you can see that it has a very good coverage of almost all the metabolic pathways. And this um, also covers a lot of functions of these metabolic pathways. So one of the exciting studies we had is through collaboration with the Child Health and Development Studies, as mentioned by Dr. Murphy. Um, this is uh, the, uh, Barbara Cohn was the, the, lead, the director of CHDS. And then we have this opportunity opportunity to answer some of the very interesting questions that um, she found in her research. So <clears throat> in this three generation studies, um, this, this is the picture of the three generation participants in this study. And it's just very fantastic to see um, these participants and then, and then how they, they are followed up through, through these years. So Barbara's team, initially, they found that women who were exposed to a certain chemical called DDT um, before age 14 increased their risk of breast cancer in their later life. And this association is only significant if the exposure occurred before the puberty. So this indicates there's some connection of the early life exposure to their later life uh, cancer risk. And if, even further, the the study also showed that the granddaughters, whose grandmothers, and this is in the first generation, who were exposed to this particular chemical when pregnant, have also higher risk of becoming obese and then start menstruation uh, earlier. Both of these are risk factors for colon cancers and a lot of other cancers. So in this study, we try to ask the question about what makes this chemical DDT so um, special. So DDT is a commonly used pesticide. It's quickly degraded, not quickly, sorry. It's de degraded to um, DDE to some level. So DDT and DDE, they are very, they always come together. <laughs> they, are, they, are very they, they are very similar in terms of their chemical structures. Um, so, but we did not see this association with breast cancer in this cohort with DDE, but we see that association with DDT. So we asked the question, what is the metabolic effects with DDT and DDE? And we found that um, the DDT is associated with a lot of changes in amino acids. And these are uh, color-coded, so the darker red and then the darker blue represent significance. The light colors are not significant associations. And with DDE, things are different. The metabolic response is mainly on the fatty acid response. <laughs> so this tells us that our method can differentiate um, things that are highly correlated and very similar in their chemical properties. In another study, we also found um, some, we use a similar approach. And in this case, we are looking at a perforinated chemical. These chemicals are used in a lot of these uh, non-sticky cookwares, um, like um, uh, flame retardants, um, furniture, carpet. Um, ETFOSAA is one of the most commonly used chemicals and is um, degraded into PFOS, PFOS. And in Barbara's work, she found that the ETFOSAA is associated with higher risk of breast cancer, but the PFOS is not. PFOS actually showed a negative association. So again, this is a very interesting question. Like these chemicals, they are naturally correlated and they are very similar, but they show completely different effects in this cohort. So we use metabolomics and see what metabolites are associated with these um, chemical exposures. And we found that they are very similar in terms of pathway levels. They all cause changes in urea cycle in non-essential amino acids. But in addition to that, the PFAS is also associated with carnitine shuttle, which is a mechanism to facilitate fatty acid oxidation. But when we look closer to those pathways, we found that the ETFOSAA has completely different or opposite direction of PFAS in terms of changing the metabolite levels. And this is color-coded 
in here. The red means increase, the blue means decrease. So you can see these two chemicals cost opposite directions of these uh, metabolites. And again, this is, show, is telling us that with metabolomics, we can very um, sensitively pick up these changes and that can explain to some extent the findings we see in epidemiology. And I talked about four chemicals already, and that's, that's already a lot for my brain to process. But <laughs> we live in a real world, so we are not just exposed to DDT. We're not just exposed to PFAS. We are exposed to a lot of things at the same time. And how do we comprehend this large data set and the large number of exposures we are experiencing? And at the same time, inside our biological systems, we have tens of thousands of metabolites that are doing their work. How do we understand the relationships with the exposures? So this analysis represents our kind of attempt to understand these associations at a higher level. So in this analysis, we try to group the chemicals by their classes, so PCBs, uh, PFAS, and lipids, which includes you know, triglycerides, cholesterols. We also group the metabolites by their correlations. So these are the N numbers. Each N number represents a metabolic community. And then we can answer the question, like what classes of chemicals are more, uh, cause more, uh, are more risky for breast cancer? And we found that the PCB and the lipid increase the risk of breast cancer. And then um, in the graph below, we show that there are certain <laughs> metabolic communities that are associated with increased risk for breast cancer, and some others are associated with decreased risk of um, breast cancer, So, which means they are more protected. And then we can also see how they are correlated with each other in this network structure. And we see a lot of crosstalk between amino acid metabolism and lipid metabolism. And this is something that we constantly see with our studies. So, so far I have shown you how we can understand the functional pathways that are associated with a chemical exposure, oh, and how we can try to put them all together and understand what is the most important relationship in, the, in our model. Next, I want to give you another example to see how, even given the already a lot of contributors, how can we identify new biological contributors? So this is a study that um, looked at a metabolite from the microbiome in the GI tract. So first, we found that there was a, a, a very strong difference of one chemical in between the conventional mice and the germ-free mice. And this chemical, we do not know its identity. So we look further, and it looks like this chemical is particularly enriched in liver mitochondria. And it's also produced by certain species of bacteria, but not by others. So that gives us some hint about maybe this, this is a um, microbiome-derived metabolite. So what does it do? Um, so we put them into mice. And then this is um, shown on the in the, in the left corner, down uh, lower corner there. And we found that um, given when the mice are given this chemical called VB, they increase their lipid deposition in their liver. So basically they develop fatty liver. And then we can also put them into cells and then study how, um, what kind of disruptions this chemical may cause to the other metabolism. And we found that it inhibits the carnitine shuttle, which I just talked about is um, essential mechanisms to help fatty acid oxidation. And later on, we also detect this chemical in humans. And we found that this chemical, valerobetin, or you know, we call it VB, is strongly associated with obesity in the human. And it's also, um, strongly associated with the visceral fat um, in the human. So it is clearly shown that this, metab uh, this metabolite derived from a microbial species is an obesogen. It causes obesity or it promotes um, disruptions in fatty acid oxidation and causes increased deposition of lipids. 
So I talked a lot about endogenous metabolites, but our methods I can actually imagine far more than endogenous metabolites. And this <coughs> slide is to give you um, idea about the scope of chemicals that we're dealing with. And I don't think this this you know we don't think about this on a on a on a daily basis, but it is a very striking number. So this. There's a close to 100,000 chemicals that are registered as toxic chemicals with EPA. There's about 1 billion therapeutic drugs that are prescribed. Um, the American, average American, Americans take four of them. I don't think, I mean, this is on the one side is good because we have so many treatment options. But on the other side, who really knows that what they really do to our cells, uh, to our systems? And then we also have essential nutrients. We have metabolic intermediates that are produced by our systems. We have um, natural products from plants. So at least there are 3,000 of them, but there are many more that are not known. So how much do we know about the chemical states around us? Not much. It's estimated that only about 10 to 40% of the stuff in our um, plasma is actually characterized. And known the identity. There's a large majority that we don't even know what they are. And this problem is kind of gets scaled up quickly considering the levels of these um, chemicals. So a lot of these ex exogenous or ex external chemicals, they exist at a much lower, lower level than our endogenous metabolites. So they can be five to seven magnitude <laughs> orders of magnitude lower than, say, cholesterol or like vitamins uh, in our system. And that's why in the past, they, often con they are often considered as clinically not important. But we know that you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about what causes disease. And maybe these chemicals that we haven't paid a lot of attention to is responsible for these unknowns. So this is estimated from WHO that about 50 million global deaths are caused by environmental exposures every year. About only half of it can be attributed to known factors like alcohol, like smoking, like um, nutritional status, um, ozone, air pollution. But there are a lot more that we do not know why they happen and what, how, what we can do about it. So, this is what we describe as the dark picture of human exosome. So let's take a look at what we already know about early onset GIP cancer. And we know there are some bad players already. And these are the things that we, you know, it tend to occur repeatedly in your studies. But can we add a little bit more granularity to these known players? Like, for example, we heard about red meat, we heard about um, nitro. Uh, compounds that from derived from these red meat. Similarly, can we do this to our diet? Can we understand what is the harmful components in the Western diet, in the red meat that are causing these uh, outcomes? And at what levels they become dangerous? Similarly, we can also ask the questions about environmental carcinogens. Can we understand what are we what are considered as carcinogens? What are the, the bad ones in the environment we should avoid? And if we can't completely avoid, can we at least know the safety levels? So there was a very interesting study that was published a, a few years back, and this is um, uh, a follow-up, 22 years follow-up <clears throat> study in Sweden. They look at 60,000 men and women, and they found that there's a one class of chemicals that in the drinking water that are associated with um, increased the risk of um, colon cancer in men, but not in women. And they found these uh, byproducts of, of chlorine disinfection, um, they, call it, they call it trihalomethanes, uh, increase, also increase the risk of developing left-sided cancer in, in, this, um, in this cohort. So maybe that is the reason why we are seeing such a, a rapid increase of early onset cancer. Maybe it's something else. 
but we need to understand what's in our water, what's in our food to maybe to be able to make those connections. So because of that need, we decided we should develop a method that can measure as many chemicals as we can in as many uh, samples as we can. So this method needs to be have high coverage of all the chemicals. This method also needs to be high throughput so we can measure tens of thousands of people and really make those connections. And this method is um, relies a lot on, again, the high resolution mm -hmm. spectrometry. And it also relies on computational method to group those signals to, into meaningful uh, chemical identities. So this is what we found in a normal human plasma. Each of these circles represent a chemical. So in some way, this is like exposure fingerprint. Everyone has a unique set of exposures. And we can take one of these out and then identify this is this chemical is a pesticide called hexachlorobenzene. We can quantify them at the population level. We can also quantify some other chemicals that we know are um, contaminants in our uh, environment. But in addition to that, we can also take out one uh, circle and although we don't know the identity of the circle, but we can go chase it and we can use computational tools and we can further validate it with more analytical chemicals. So this is one example. This little finger point occurs both in human plasma and in human lung. And we found that it's actually vitamin D3 and it's all validated by um, more analytical uh, methods here. So the take home message here is that right now we have the technology, we have the methods that can profile a, a large number of chemicals a diverse with diverse classification, different functions, different applications. On the right hand, and, and I apologize for the small font size, but basically we look at these chemicals in patients with liver disease and some of them are in the United States states and some of them are in Norway and we compare them by geographic location we compare them by the status of disease and then the age um, the vitamin intake we can answer all these questions once we have the information of exposure so I, I think the in the next few years we will see a lot of these similar studies that where we can for the first time, see um, a lot of things that we haven't seen before in a large cohort. So my next few minutes will be um, dedicated to another topic I'm very interested in. And then um, this is going back to my first mention about ecosystem. So we all know that the ecosystem lives on network. Everything is connected to each other and it forms this network. Nothing exists by isolation. And Sometimes in the field of, at least in the field of environmental science, it feels like everything is connected to each other. But I want to stress that it's not. Um, the connections are not random, and we know that. And this is based on a lot of uh, uh, pioneer work in the field of network theory, um, in mathematics and in physics. And now we know that the biological system, they have certain rules of organization. And this certain rules is hierarchical. So they have certain communities in the network. And this is called modular. Sorry about the mathematic term. But basically it's describing there are different communities in the whole network. And within each community, there's several hubs. These hubs are the things that are highly connected to the, the rest of members of communities. And by mathematic definition, they are very important in terms of the contribution to the community. And those are the things that we can think about. What are the most important things among these connections? What are the most important and like? And on the right here, you can see that is a, this is an example of an E. coli metabolism. Actually, this is very, very simplified. Metabolism. The, even in E. coli, this is, the real metabolism is much, much complicated than this. But by this simplification, you can see the structure of the network that it is actually organized in several functional modules. 
And within modules, there are highly connected molecules called hubs. So we use this network theory and we uh, develop tools that integrate different layers of molecular uh, uh, methods. So such as transcriptomics uh, and metabolomics, epigenomics, proteomics. So we can all bring all these multi-omics <coughs> together and try to understand what are the connections um, among and between different layers. But here in the interest of time, I want to show you one example about understanding the connections between the environmental exposures and the metabolic response of the system. And this is a work, again, uh, you know, that's done by with Barbara Cohn's uh, CHDS cohort. This study is led by Yang Li Go, a professor at, at Emory University School of Medicine. In this study, she looks at the chemicals that are associated with um, early onset breast cancer. And these are the chemicals that the, these women are being exposed to during their pregnancy. So each of these connections here, it, it might be, it might be even really hard to see the connections, but everything here is, the connections is you know, behind the, the nose, so it's hard to see. But the circles in, in the middle are the chemicals are uh, considered as dietary or you know, environmental chemicals. And all the squares around it are endogenous metabolites. So using this network integration tool, um, she was able to identify there were three communities of the network that seems to be very important. The first community, C1, have a lot of overlap with the second community, C2. And the F1 and F2 are the most important chemicals. So F1 is, turns out, is hydroxyretinoid acid. So this is a vitamin A metabolite. It's commonly, uh, it's very common to uh, get it from the diet. Uh, another chemical is F2, is unidentified. So we don't know what it is here. But <laughs> on the left hand side, you will see this community C3. It consists of a number of environmental chemicals. Two of them are F4 and F3 um, here. They are commonly used as pesticides. So they are real contaminants from the environment. And then we can also ask the questions, what are the metabolic response associated with these uh, chemicals? And we found that the C1 and the C2 have caused a lot of response in terms of fatty acids, lipid metabolism, and inflammatory response. So arachidonic acid, prostaglandin, these are typical signatures for inflammation. But on the left-hand side, we see that these C3 chemicals, they cause a lot of response in amino acid uh, metabolism. And again, if you remember the, from the previous slides, amino acid seems to play an important role in breast cancer risk. And in this study, again, they are finding the similar thing. Yes, these pathways are associated with early onset breast cancer. So um, I think I will just restress that how important it is to um, put everything in its context. The context is complicated. It involves a lot of things. But without the context, we won't be able to know what is really the function that is changing. And so over the past 20 years, we have learned a lot. And these statements, they are just basic plain fact. And we already know that. The, from the epigenomics, we know that a lot of these epigenetic changes, they are co-occurring. They have different um, functions, different change levels, making it very complex to know actually what's causing the cellular transformation. And with metabolomics and proteomics, we now know that actually first time we can see actually that is the case, we have a very crowded high density environment that have you know, thousands or millions actually of reactions that are happening at the same time. With single cell omics, we now know that every cell is different. No cells are alike. A cellular phenotype is very dynamic and it's also changing all the time. Um, how do we understand the change of cell identity is a big <coughs> question because first we need to I, we need to def define what a cell's identity 
And from metagenomics, we know that the GI microbiome is impacted by a lot of environmental chemicals, and they're very sensitive to these exposures. When I, I, want, I want to first point out, I want to, you know, that this, is, this has already been talked about, but I want to point it out again that the first 1,000 days after birth is a very important uh, period for gut microbiome development. And we're seeing a lot of these early life exposures, maybe microbiome is a mediator in this connections between early life exposure and the later life cancer risk. And coming from all those angles, um, the exposome is actually a new field that embraces all those possibilities. And from the exposure standing point, we are now seeing more and more understanding of GI mm -hmm. cancer and early onset GI cancer. We now know that the lifestyle in combination probably contributes more than a single factor of the lifestyle. I talked about that these infection products in the drinking water. I talked, there's also other studies that have shown the food additives, like there was one study about this emulsifiers that you add into muffins. Those cause microbiome change, significant. And um, there's also studies show that when you have a past infection of GI tract, it actually leaves a molecular scar that changes your epigenetic marks. And those epigenetic marks may have a long-term effect in contributing to your future cancer risk. So all of these, you know, these are just single isolated small points of the whole landscape we are seeing. But these are the points that a lot of people haven't thought about. Before. And, um, I think for the next few years, it's really important to bring those points together and really just to, to give us an idea of what is the whole landscape look like. So with that, I'm, I'm in the spirit of thinking outside the box, I want to um, kind of argue again that instead of waiting for the linear science to take its course and hoping that someday we will have a breakthrough, I think it is important that we um, call out for systemic novel thinking of what's driving um, the, these transformations. And I think this, nowadays we are at a point that we have these methods, we have these theories, we have these techniques that we can measure things that we have never measured before. We can connect us that we have never connected before. We can cross these things that we never crossed. So I think that is, that is my kind of take home message and the kind of a, a, a big shout out here is that I think, you know, the, from, we learn from the history that working in a, you know, isolated um, discipline or molecular doesn't really work very well, but I think it's time for us to, to come together and then, and then understand these, these connections. So um, these, a lot of work presented here today is um, done by these <laughs> fantastic people. I want to just mention that the Hercules, Hercules Exposome Research Center at Emory is a great resource if you guys are interested in um, exposure work. We are the first center that's in the United States that focused on exposome research. And we do reach out to different communities about to form a hub <clears throat> to really understand better about um, human health and human health. So thank you. <laughs>